Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Oh, it, it, welcome everybody to our July 20th, 2020 20 yeah, Board of Education ready. regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, will you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you all, please. Yep. President McFarland. Right in. Uh, let's go right to the consent agenda. We have item 2.1, that's approval of the minutes from June 29, 2020 regular meeting. 2.2, 2, uh, there are staff members recommended for employment for the 2021 school year. Uh, 2.3 is the following person to announce their resignation as of the following dates. Uh, 2.4 is the adoption of the Midland School Code Articles 105 and 105C, the schools of choice. That information can be found in the agenda. Uh, item 2.5 is the June 2020 financials, although they're not available until the end of August Board of Education meeting. Uh, there is an attached uh, bond executive or sum uh, summary for information. Uh, six is approval of legal payments to Truon for $484.50. For professional legal fees. <coughs> Make a motion, please, for the consent agenda. Make a motion to approve items 2.1 through 2.6 of the consent agenda. Support. Motion by Phil, support by Lynn. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, item three. Uh, these are Board of Education matter presentations to the board. Uh, we have Brian Bruton. This is a tax resolution for the 2020-21 tax collection. Brian. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so tonight you are going to see the same tax numbers that we've been talking about for pretty much over a month now. We first saw these numbers at the first June Board of Education meeting. We talked about those when we were proposing the budget, and we also had to approve those for the city of Midland. They needed the numbers a little bit earlier, if you remember, because they need those for the summer tax collection. What this resolution does tonight is it authorizes me to be able to send a form called the L4029 to our other taxing municipalities. There are no changes in the numbers that I'm going to present to you, but I will, um, for transparency purposes, just go through them quickly one more time um, so the public can hear them as well, too. There's four rates that are being established tonight for the fiscal year 21 budget. The first is the typical 18 mil non-homestead um, allowance. That is something that has not changed. The next is a rate that fluctuates from year to year, and it fluctuates based on a complex formula of how much we collected the year before, property tax values, all with the goal of us being able to collect our additional $415.31 per pupil. So we go through a complex set of calculations to come up with that rate. And this year it came out at 1.6486 mils. The third rate that you're establishing tonight is your commercial personal property tax rate. Commercial personal property is a, it's, it's, it's an 18 mil assessment, but they are exempt from the first 12 mils, taking that down to six, but they are not exempt from the hold harmless. So you add the 1.6486 I just talked to you about coming up with a grand total of 7.6486 mils. And then finally, um, our bond debt, which is to help us pay for the construction projects that was voted in back in 2015. So the four rates, the non-homestead, hold harmless, commercial personal property, and the 2.95 bond debt millage collection. And so again, this resolution tonight will allow me to send this off to our other taxing municipalities 
And this traditionally has been a roll call vote. So once the roll call vote comes in, um, Cindy and I will get to work tomorrow sending this out to the rest of our municipalities so that they can get their tax collections ready for the next cycle. I'll, I'll make a motion, Scott. I move to approve the certification resolution for the 2020-21 fiscal year taxes. A complete copy of the resolution can be or shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. I'll support that. All right. So <clears throat> roll call vote. Okay. Um, I'm back. Ready, so Scott? Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you. I was, I was stuck in mute there for a second. Uh, okay, let's please do a roll call vote. All right, President McFarland. Yes. Vice President Singer. Yes. Secretary Roush. Yes. Uh, Member Baker. Yes. Member Blazy. Yes. Member Lauterbach. Yes. Resolution passes with six zeros. Scott. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay, item 3.2, this is for information, uh, progress update, Midland Public Schools, uh, safe roadmap. Mr. Jasper. <clears throat> Thank you, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll start with a quick uh, recap of all that's happened over the past three weeks. And really some of the um, developments that were set in motion with the governor's announcement on June 30th. At that time, she had released the um, My Safe Schools My Safe. Michigan 2020 Turn to School Roadmap. And that is intended to provide guidance to schools on how to reopen. About one week later, um, MPS responded and shared some initial thoughts with uh, our stakeholders. Uh, there was information that went out to staff. Also, community members received an update in the communique. Um, and the reason I mention that is because I want to point out that that was not the plan or that was not our response to the governor's roadmap. So it's not the entire plan. Those were just some initial ideas. So I, I wanted to make that point um, here at the board meeting for everyone just to clarify. Also that week, uh, districts across the state received a template that was distributed through professional organizations. And the intention was that school districts would use that template to begin to create their own version of the return to school uh, reopening plans for each district. So the return to school roadmap does provide guidance to districts, but it is important to note that there are also many required components that are not optional that every district must incorporate into their plan. So what this is going to do is it's going to cause all districts to complete uh, um, a plan, reevaluate how they intend to open and create many new procedures and of course implement lots of different safety protocols to stay in compliance with those required areas and then also to consider many of the strongly recommended components that the governor thinks uh, that would be worth adopting as well. Currently uh, we are in the process of creating uh, multiple plans and the reason I say multiple plans is because if you complete the template as it's shared, it does require you to have a separate plan for uh, the state possibly moving back to phase three. You have a plan for reopening if we stay in our current phase four designation and then you have to have a response to how your district will operate if you are moved or if the state is moved to phase five. So really within this one requirement of completing this template, there's really three plans that need to be, need to be developed for the district. And, you know, as you, uh, I think some of you maybe have uh, taken the time to look at that uh, original template that was probably shared for information. I think it's pretty clearly delineated in there that each of those um, are quite extensive it's going to require a lot of work to fill in all those details. So we are um, sharing that responsibility here. Curriculum office uh, under Penny's leadership is, is taking a look mainly at the information required in section A, which is the, the remote learning plan if we move back to phase three. Um, I am doing a lot of the work and taking the lead with principals and, and Mike certainly 
on how we're going to respond in phase four um, with all the safety restrictions in place. And then again, um, when you get to the third section, section C, what do we, um, what does it look like in phase five and which of the required restrictions would we not continue to use? Uh, it's still your choice as a district, how many of those required components um, you, you would keep if they've already been implemented for the school year. Um, the last section in the template is actually your district's response to why you would be removing any of the strongly recommended items. And so you need to really make your case for why you're doing so. And all of this work needs to be in its final form and ready for the Board of Education to approve no later than August uh, 15th. Our hope is that all of this information will be done within the next week to 10 days and so that it could be considered early in August. Given that our region is currently in phase four, as I had said, the focus is, is certainly um, on planning for students to return face to face. And with that information that's gone out in the communique, many people have, have noted and taken interest in the fact that there will be some online options available as well. So uh, as we are developing our return to school plan, we are certainly continuing to work on a virtual option for those parents and families that aren't comfortable sending students given the face-to-face -face option. Um, some of the next steps for the district include meeting with district and building leadership uh, this week, further discussing what these safety protocols are gonna look like. We also have um, continued development of this virtual option that I just mentioned. We're gonna continue to gather some input from employee groups and then I know that we are certainly going to need to meet um, soon with uh, bargaining groups to discuss, you know, what, what that might look like for teachers and work conditions and so forth. <clears throat> so there's, there's still lots of layers to it, and that's why we don't have the complete plan ready for your approval tonight, but uh, we're working diligently to make sure that we get that together for you in early August. Okay. I'll add a little bit, Scott, to uh, Jeff's um, piece of it as well, that um, we plan on releasing um, an FAQ document later this week that should assist with a lot of the information that uh, people are seeking out there. Um, but it still won't be the completed documents. We need to take that time to bring that information to you um, as we go forward. But this this will be a very fluid situation probably to the actual day we start school. If we start school, there's still some speculation of what stage we may be in by the time school starts. And so we'll have to watch that very closely. We've um, purchased a lot of personal uh, protection of equipment that you're going to see this evening to in order to make the in-school environment as safe as possible. Um, we know there's a lot of anxiety out in our state, our nation right now, about schools starting up schools. Um, we feel it is our obligation to provide as much options as we can and be as transparent as we can, but at the same time realize the parents are going to have a very difficult uh, choice and they're all in a different spot on that choice. And so we're going to try to recognize that some will need full face-to-face -face instruction five days a week. Some may want a partial face-to-face -face instruction with a blended option. And then those who, are, who want a completely 100% virtual education at this point in time. Then they want the ability to be able to potentially move back and forth as we move through phases. And so we're going to try to accommodate as much as we can, knowing that we can't accommodate at all. And there's a lot of moving pieces in this. Jeff mentioned our bargaining units. We, we, you know, we obviously will need our teachers on board. We meet with them this week um, to discuss not only some of the safety protocols we're taking, but that there's going to be some things we're going to need and work with them on bargaining that's never been addressed in, a, in an environment like we're going to go into. So their collective bargaining agreement will control many of those things and so we're not able to provide that all the information until all those things are dealt with and gone through okay i think all right so it sounds like um we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there uh, mike i was able to understand almost everything that you said uh, mike and jeff thank you very much uh for the the update and um you know, certainly it's important to understand there's a lot of fluidity here and the 
big takeaway, I think, for the community is probably just to be patient and wait till we get a little more uh, direction from the state um, to see exactly where we're going to have to go. But the moral is, is that we're, we're prepared and, and we're going to move forward in any direction that they give us. Um, does anybody have any questions for Jeff or Mike regarding this? I know this is kind of an important topic before we move on. All right. Um, next up. Hang on, Brad. Brad has something. Oh, Brad. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I apologize. Megan, can you unmute Brad? There he goes. Okay. Um, I wanted to get unmuted first. I guess was my point. Um, I apologize. I couldn't understand anything that he said. So I, 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 on my connection, I couldn't understand anything. So I, I apologize. But um, I know moving forward, we have a lot of work to do still. But um, I just have to make mention that I couldn't understand any of it. Basically, to sum it up real quick, Brad, we got we got some feedback on my end in in the boardroom, but there's an FAQ document that's coming out that should answer many of the questions. Okay. Any other questions, anybody? Okay, Brad. Anything else? Brad, anything else? All right. Next up will be item three point three. This is an action item uh, regarding custodial supply. Mr. Bruton. Sure. Um, so every single year we put out a bid for custodial supplies and you guys see in your board packet agenda that we have a tab that specifies who was the low bidder for each of the supplies mm -hmm. that we typically use throughout the year. Um, it doesn't happen very often that the winner has a combination that is above the state bid threshold. But this year you saw that Central Polycore, when you combine what our needs are for the year, did come in at a rate that was above that threshold. So we're gonna ask for your approval tonight to award um, the bid for tissue liners and towels to Central Polycore of Linden, New Jersey for $34,596.75 for our initial order of those supplies. Okay, thanks Brian. Uh, I'll take a motion please. I move to approve the purchase order for $34,596.75 to Central Policy Corporation in Linden, New Jersey for custodial supplies. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Phil. Any discussion on item 3.3? .3? Brian, do you have a how long that uh, supply is gonna last? You said that's initial. Yeah, we project that that's going to last us through the semester is what our anticipation is. Um, but sometimes they go quicker, sometimes they go slower. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of item 3.3, .3, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Item 3.3 .3 passes. Thank you. Next up, another action item, item 3.4. This is the HH Dow High Media Center. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, sir. These items 3.1 and 3.2 both relate to the damage that was done by the dam breach. And these are the final two items that we have to get approved to be able to complete our repairs on that media center. Um, if you recall before, moisture mitigation is done. We are now ready to award the flooring for item 3.1 and also the replacement of furniture for item 3.2. So first item 3.1, the flooring, we did put that out to bid rather than just going with our initial serve pro estimates. And the low bidder came in at $57,365. And that vendor was O'Connor's Decorating Center Inc. out of Saginaw, Michigan. So we are recommending award to that agency this evening. And we're going to pay for this using our insurance reclamation, our capital projects fund, and any FEMA monies that we are able to get from this point forward. So we ask for your approval for item 3-1, the floor in tonight. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we'll take a motion for item 3.1, please. Actually, make a motion. Sub one. Sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the flooring at Dow High, item 3.4.1. For the total of $57,365. Support. Motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any discussion on 3.4.1?
Brian, do you have any more information on where we stand financially in this transaction? You you have you named three different options where funds could come from. Is there any more information? Yes, um, sir. Yep, so we are through our first initial round of insurance and we were able to reclaim about $25,000 through a water backup rider that we had. And so that's where we are with our actual Liberty Mutual insurance right now. I have on Wednesday a webinar with FEMA that works specifically with public agencies. And that is a requirement for us to go through that training piece. And then from there, I'm able to enter our claims into the FEMA system. And um, from some of the initial reports, we're cautiously optimistic that we're gonna be able to reclaim some of these funds. So that will be the next um, funding source that we have to be able to go to. So I don't know where that's gonna flush out, but my approvals this evening will allow me to be able to submit actuals to them within that website. And so we'll continue our venture into trying to reclaim as much as we possibly can for these damages. So the twenty five thousand for the water backup is that our is that our max? Is that the That's correct. Okay. And for the few monies, do you know if those will be um um super duper low interest loans or is that grant essentially grant style monies? Um, the rumors that I'm hearing, and this is without going through the training, is that it's not low interest loans, that it's grant monies. I've heard 75%, but again, that's rumor and speculation. And once I go through the actual training, I'll have more concrete facts to be able to give you on that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks, Brad. Anybody else? Okay. All in favor of item 3.4.1, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Uh, next up, uh, Brian, 3.4.2. Yes, sir. So same story. This is for the damage that was done by the dam breach over in the Dow High Media Center. Um, unfortunately, there was just enough water that came back in through our sewer system that we did lose all of our bookcases over at Dow High. and We did lose some of our soft seating as well, too. So we went back to the same corporation that gave us the furniture through the bond, Duel, um, and we used through them the same national contract purchasing program that we have. So we will walk the media center with um, Melissa Toner, our administrator, and also with the Dow High team as well to make sure that we were replacing everything that we lost. So a direct replacement of that furniture came to $80,079.40, and we're recommending the award for that furniture replacement to Duell Corporation of Holland, Michigan, same company that had put the original furniture in in the first place. Okay. Thank you, Brian. I'll accept a motion for item 3.4.2, please. Make a motion to approve 3.4.2 for the total of $80,079.40 to Duell Corporation of Holland, Michigan for the furniture purchase. Support. Okay, uh, motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any discussion on item 3.4, motion 3.4.2? Kind of have the same question for you, Brian. Is it different for content? For content. No, we, we believe we're going to be able to submit these claims to FEMA as well, too. But um, the 25000 that I told you, that was what we believe our max reclamation is going to be for our insurance company for water backup, moisture mitigation, contents, et cetera. Um, we were able to submit the bills that we had. We're going to keep trying again and work those channels, but we believe at this point that we're done with Liberty Mutual and are moving on to FEMA. That's where we are at this point, but we'll keep pursuing actions. And when we do have our next FFO meeting, we're going to talk with our committee about um, our ability or their wishes to join in a class action as well um, for maybe future reclamation of funds which could be years from now, um, which I'm sure a lot of residents are dealing with that as well, too. But we believe that there could be an avenue there as well, too, that could lead to long term information. Okay. Thank you, Brad. Anybody else? All right. All in favor of support supporting motion 3.4.2, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. 3.4.2 passes. Uh, next up is an action item 3.5. This is return to school equipment orders. Uh, Mr. Bruton. Yes, sir. Thank you. Four subsections under 3.5.
And before we get deep into this one, I do want to, for transparency purposes, let you know that all items one, two, three, and four, we did order these items last week. Um, the reason that we did order these is we went through our return to school roadmap work as Mr. Jaster, Mr. Sherrill had talked about. And the minute that we went through that and read some of the strongly recommended and required items, we knew that procurement is going to be very, very difficult to be able to get this equipment in and on time. So we went to board policy, double checked ourselves. We know that during emergency situations, we have the ability to procure equipment. And then our policy dictates that we bring it to you at the next board of education meeting. So um, we are a little bit of a weak delay on this, but we are bringing it to you at the very next opportunity that we have. So items one, two, three, and four, we have ordered, but we do want to bring them to you and inform you about those as policy dictates. And we'd like to have you act on these as well too. So item one is bus temperature scanners. And we are going to be installing 43 of these door temperature scanners. Um, each of the buses that we believe are going to be in our route system this year. And we recommend the issuance of the purchase order to Safety Vision of Houston, Texas. Again, for 43 of the devices for $45,938.19. So that's item 3.51. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. I, well, I guess we'll handle these uh, by each subparagraph. Um, so I'll take a motion for item 3.51, please. I move to approve the purchase order for $45,938.19 to Safety Vision of Houston, Texas for 43 bus door temperature scanning devices. Support. support. Motion by Pam, support by Lynn. Any discussion? It, I don't know if you, if you mentioned it, Brian. Um, I think it is important to know that these are pay, being paid for uh, through funds that uh, have been procured uh, through the CARES Act. Yep, thanks, Scott. And not I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I'll go a little bit into that for you just to give you a, a brief update there as well, too. Um, we right now are juggling a various amount of CARES Act dollars that are coming in during different under different guys, under different rules, under different guidelines. Um, right now, we know that we have roughly somewhere around $730,000 that are coming into the district. We know that this week the legislature is about to act on another $1.3 million to the good that would come to us in Midland to have that. We think and anticipate, and I say this with a degree of reservation because I don't like to count my chickens before they hatch, that in the end, we may have somewhere around the $2 million in CARES funds to be able to, to deal with. So we are continuing to track these and making decisions to use them in the wisest way possible. Um, so we are gonna manage these funds to procure this equipment, but also to make sure that we're providing services that align with the return to school roadmap that Jeff and Penny and everyone's working on as well too. So thanks for that reminder, Scott, I appreciate it. Okay, any further discussion on 3.5.1? So were there any other that you looked at besides uh, this particular style or company? Yes. Um, for each of these items, for one, two, three, and four, um, we did a lot of vetting on our end, not just of the quality of the vendor, but also to ensure that the devices would work with what our current fleet is, but also to make sure that we were getting a price that was either the best or comparable for the items as well too. So we've been gathering paperwork behind the scenes to ensure that there isn't gouging going on. And I will be very transparent with you that the procurement world when it comes to personal protective equipment is complex. There are vendors that are coming out of every single which way and how. Um, and so it's it's been a, a large group of very dedicated employees that have been vetting this for us. And we have to give some credit to Mike Mogenberg, to Tracy Reed, and also to Lori Holderby that have been doing a lot of homework on these companies to ensure that we're getting a comparable and equitable and in a lot of cases, the best price. And also to make sure that these just aren't fake vendors that are popping up because we run into a lot of those and trying to procure these different pieces of equipment. It really is difficult with every single school in the state and largely the nation as well too, going after these pieces of equipment. So we've done our diligence on the back end and we've also save paperwork as well too, just to make sure that we can um, appease auditors and anyone who have questions on 
whether we did our diligence and homework on procuring the best equipment for the best price. Will we right. have the time for school to start? I hope so. Um, we ordered as quickly as we could. And when we talked to vendors and they would tell us the obligatory four to six weeks, we would make them put down on paper what their guaranteed delivery date was. Um, but what time has taught us is that sometimes the equipment when it's in route does get procured in other spots. Specifically, you've had that problem with N95 masks. Sometimes you will order N95 masks, they'll get to an Amazon procurement center and then they'll be taken for first line responders, which I'm glad that's where they're going to. Um, but it is an interesting game when it comes to procurement. So we have done our best effort to ensure that it's going to be in school in time. And we are going to stay on our vendors to make sure that they're staying with their guidelines. And we did pass up a couple of vendors on some of these items as well, too, that would not commit to delivery deadlines as well. So we are confident that we've done the best that we can to be able to get it here in a timely fashion. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brian, for being so proactive and, and staying ahead of the ahead of the curve to the extent that we're able to. Um, any further discussion? I just have a question. I, I, how much of the purchase price are we holding back until we receive the products? Varies by vendor. Um, mostly it's 50% down, 50% upon delivery has been our standard protocol on it. When you're ordering in such large quantities, some had different terms on it, but we don't like to give anything more than 50%. And some of these are pure purchase order driven, which is simply us issuing a purchase order then it's complete upon delivery. <clears throat> um, but the 50 down and the 50 upon delivery was in place for our desk shields, which will be your item two. Um, and true. we also had to do that with our masks as well too, because that was a larger order for a local vendor and they needed the cash to be able to procure the actual physical mask before they did the embroidery. So it's varied by vendor. Okay. All right. All in favor of Got item three. And yes, Brad. Number one is mandatory for our buses to test prior to entering a bus. It's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. That's something we've selected to do. Screening was recommended. Okay. So it's not mandatory, but highly recommended. Correct. Temperature highly scanning. Strongly, I think Mr. Jaster would know the verbiage of the plan better than I, but it was screening, as I know, is some degree of recommendation. Okay. Anything else, Brad? Or anybody else? Okay. All right. All in favor of supporting 3.5.1, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Next up, 3.5.2, desk shields. Thanks, right. sir. So a repeat, same funding sources that we had talked about before, same alignment to the roadmap. Um, these desk shields are something that we investigated. Um, this was a little bit complicated as well because the shape and type of furniture that we have throughout the district varies greatly. I think those of you that have had students in multiple schools know that there's tables in one, there's desks in another, and then when you think of Central Park, there's puzzle tables. We've actually been working for quite some time to build collaborative spaces, and collaborative spaces and social distancing are a very tough combination to put together. So we wanted to come up with a solution um, that we could to try and make sure that we could keep um, the students as safe as possible when it came to the various types of furniture that are in the district. And we did um, come upon desk shields. And so these desk shields, um, we actually do have samples of them down here in central office that we've been testing with various chemicals and different furniture setups. But we know that it's going to be movable, moldable, and will allow us without actually drilling into the tables to be able to give each student kind of a personalized workspace. So we are recommending that Dobbs Global of St. Augustine, Florida, um, gets the purchase for 10,000 desk shields. That is a little bit higher um, than the number of students that we have, but that's because we have multiple complex setups when it comes to students. Um, we have media centers that we want to fit with these things as well, too. And these are building administrators asking for some extras for various purposes that they had. So the total on that 10,000 desk shield purchase was $197,902.16. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'll take a motion for item 3.5.2, please. I move to approve the purchase. Go ahead, Phil. <laughs> 
Move to approve item 3.5.2 for the purchase of desk, desk shields uh, for the total of $197,902.16. Support. <clears throat> Motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any discussion on this item? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, okay. Yes, Brad. So is the, the plan for shields would be for every single desk and or workstation in the entire district from every grade level from pre-K through 12. That's is correct. That, okay. Yes. And is that a poly shield and is it, um, if it's a little bit higher with our 10,000 mark than what we need from our 7,700 students, um, do you know how long these would last or you have a guess of what you're hoping to get out of it? Is it a semester? We're hoping to get the full year out of it. Um, one of the things that we did with this company, is we had them rush ship them to us. We gave them to our Enviro Clean and Building Manager group and we had them put them through the ringer um, with various cleaning sprays. We had them really abuse them as much as we possibly could to make sure that they were durable and that they would do what we wanted them to do. So. We are hoping that we get the year out of these devices. Um, we know that we will have to replace some, which is a part of our overage order as well too, as well as there were price breaks at certain points of ordering as well. So um, with the different products that we brought in and had rushed shipped to us, this was the one that we believe is gonna stand up the best and will serve our purpose the best for what we are trying to get out of them. Okay. And I guess I kind of had the same question. Is that a, this is kind of a secondary, this is not a mandatory uh, in the governor's document. Um, is this even mentioned in the governor's document? I'll defer this one to Mr. Jasper for a concrete answer, but I do not believe death shields were mandatory. I believe that it was part of us trying to um, protect students the best that we possibly could. But Mr. Jasper, please step in. Brian is correct. Um, a desk shield is not a required piece of equipment. Um, you know, they talk about the, the masks, uh, grades 6 through 12 was required. And then whenever there's commingling for grades K through 5, the mask is required. But this desk shield uh, was viewed as another uh, step that could be taken to um, ensure some space between students and some protection. So, Brad, we got to this uh, shield because our our room configuration does not allow. Room configuration does not allow. We got bad feedback here, but uh, the room configuration doesn't allow for social distancing. So, with puzzle tables and um, the, the the type of tables we have in the district, we needed a configuration that would assist in the mask wearing to protect the child, children. So that's how we came up with the desk shield. A lot of districts are going to the desk shields. Children, so that's how we came up with the desk shield. A lot of districts are going to the desk shields. Okay. Is there any fastening at all, Brian, of this to a, to a surface so it won't tip over? No, there isn't. Um, but it does have um, a piece that it, it's weighted at the bottom of it. It has actual inserts that serves a dual purpose. Um, it really is kind of a flashback because the dual purpose for the weighted piece at the bottom really kind of reminds me of the old anti-cheating devices, you know, back in the day when the teacher would put the folder up so people couldn't look at your paper. So it has kind of that function to it. But when I looked at it, I said, man, this thing's really heavy. It, it's there so it can't just be blown over easily. Um, we probably brought three or four different samples in and there were ones that were as cheap as could be and there were ones that are actually physically fastened to the desk and the ones that were physically fastened to the desk you'd be paying somewhere between 200 and 250 dollars per piece in between them and again the multiple configurations we didn't think that there was any way that we could either a procure the custom configurations or b have the staff that would actually do that and ruin our tables for you know a longevity as well too so this was a solution that we felt fit the needs the best well, you kind of beat me to my last question. Um, in the picture of the document, um, there's kind of a cut sheet built into our invoice, and the shields look very reflective. Is that 
could you that can, be an issue? That no, you, you can see right through them, um, and it does not. We don't believe that there's going to be that reflective nature to them. So, again, we brought them in um, to our administration center and took them out to a building, um, and it's something that we feel, again, was our best solution to it. Is it 110% perfect to be determined? We'll see how they last, but with the testing that we did on it, we felt that it was the best product for the needs that we have. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All in favor of the motion for item 3.5.2, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Next up, 3.5.3, face masks or masks, Brian. Thank you, sir. Um, this is one that I had talked about where we had to put a little bit of money down ahead of time and the actual purchase, the invoice that you <clears throat> from you is not exceeding what the state bid threshold is. But in the end, when it's all said and done, there's gonna be two orders combined that will exceed that state threshold, which is why we're bringing it forward to you um, to be transparent in what the total <clears throat> is gonna be. When it's all said and done, the total purchase is gonna be $32,500. That's for 10,000 masks. And we will a we were able to work with um, the local company, Hanley's Custom Sports, to be able to fill that order for us. Um, we have half of those in now. They're working on procuring the other half and getting those for us. So um, we ask that you approve that for us this evening, please. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, I'll take a motion for item 3.5.3, .3, please. Make a motion to approve item 3.5.3 for the purchase of the mass for $32,500. Support. Motion uh, made by Phil, support by Lynn. Any discussion? Hey, Brian, what are the masks going to say? We already kind of hinted a little bit earlier that they are embroidered. Yeah, it just has a little Midland Public Schools logo on the side of them. Um, again, we have some of those in, we can show those to you at one time, but they also do on the inside of them have a white strip that's in there so that we can actually have names written in them as well, too. We can just imagine that, you know, with some of our younger students, that this is going to be a little bit complicated about whose mask is what and what gets dropped and things like that, which is why we did overage orders as well, too. <laughs> so we will have on site um, these masks, but we are also ordering N95s for our quarantine room. And we will have disposables as well, too, at our buildings that are all part of separate procurement orders as well for um, different various backup plans. So um, we'll be sure that when we can actually physically see each other that we show you those desk shields. And we'll also um, show you those masks as well, too, because, again, we have half of our order already in. Okay. Could you hear me? No. How many times can you wash these, Brian? They are washable. Um, I do not recall the number of times that you can wash them, but we did purchase a bit of an upgrade on it. it there was a cheaper, good, better, best type option of it, and we made sure that we were ordering a very quality material because we know that they are going to be well used. We strongly acknowledge that um, masks are probably going to be person personalized. We know that people have ones they've been wearing for a while. We know that students are going to be bringing their own as well, too. But we want to make sure that we are supplying masks um, for our students, for our staff to be able to use. In addition to this, it gets even more complex. We're ordering face shields. We're ordering clear masks for students that have special needs as well. So we're going to have as many options as we possibly can. Um, these masks themselves um, are of a quality material that we think will hopefully last us throughout the year as well. Or at least until we're in phase six, which is hopefully sooner rather than later. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All in favor of the motion to support item 3.5.3, .3, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next up, item 3.5.4, school temperature scanning gate. Brian. Thanks, Scott. So the last of the purchases to inform you of tonight is the school temp scanning gate, and I think this is a perfect example 
of how our plan is rapidly changing. Um, a couple of board meetings back, you remember that we bought um, temperature scanning iPad devices, and we had initially thought that that was going to be all that we were going to need. But the deeper that we got into planning stages, we know that getting students into the building is something that we want to be done safely yet efficiently as well too. We want to preserve as much instructional time as we possibly can. So in the brief overview PowerPoint that we released to the public on there, it said that we were procuring two gates per secondary school. Our administrators gave us some rapid feedback that they would like additional gates to be able to get kids in in a more safe and efficient and timely fashion. So we have modified that and we are going to 12 um, gates and putting in three gates at each of our secondary schools to speed up the process. That will then allow us to divert some of the temp sensing iPads down to our elementary level so they'll have multiple devices and entry points as well too for their plan. So we think that um, K through 12, this is going to help us with getting kids in quicker and safer. So we are asking for a purchase order for $27,799.88 to be delivered to Med Supply of Troy. And this is for 12 temperature scanning gates. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, I will take a motion for item 3.5.4, please. I move to approve the purchase order for $27,799.88 to Med Supply of Troy, Michigan for 12 temperature scanning gates. Or Motion by Pam, support by John. Any discussion on item 3.5.4? What's the difference between the two types? Between the iPads or between the gates? Uh, between the gates, the Dash sure. 1, Dash 3, besides the price. Yep, um, two of them have metal detecting sensor capabilities as well, too. Um, and that's the higher price on those. And one of those will go over to the high schools. That will not be turned on as inactive, um, but when it came to procurement, that was something that was an additional add-on that we thought maybe at a future date could come in useful. But for now, we're going to be using for the temperature scanning piece only. So those would be those particular models would be at the secure entrance. Both That's of those. correct, sir. Yes. Okay. And what's the difference between these versus the previous? Uh, model that we purchased or the, pre the previous model are ipads and they mount on a, it's like a five foot stand and they mount on the five foot stand and there's someone that stands behind them and they see the thermal readout of it whereas the gates when they walk through is not an ipad um it's behind it it's got we haven't seen them in action yet but it has kind of like a light that will flash and it also has an audible alarm if you turn it on so we have the ability to either do a flash that's that's visual for the administrator to see um, but I believe you can activate an audio alarm as well, too. Installation, I believe, on these is going to be next Thursday. So we'll be able to test these through and see how quickly we can get in. We've heard that it's one second increment, which will give us plenty of time because if you are six foot distancing, that's going to be more than one second anyway. So it should allow us multiple entry points to be able to get kids through in a safe fashion. So when one of these does go off, we have things that we're working on with that as well. That would be Mr. Jasser's arena, and I know that he's working with building principals on how to handle that. Um, we're also working on that with our bus drivers as well, too, to make sure that we're handling it um, in the most sensitive way that we possibly can um, to make sure that we're keeping everyone safe, but also protecting privacy ways um, that we know are um, necessary as well, too. So we are working on those protocols behind the scene to be able to train our building staff and to be able to train our driving staff as well, too on what happens um, if one of these does read a temperature that's above what the threshold is. Okay, great. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion for item 3.5.4, say aye. 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 Uh, and any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much, Brian. We appreciate all the hard work and all the forward thinking to make sure our schools and our kids are as safe as, as possible. Thanks, um, next up, item four, this is a request to address the board. Mike, do we have anybody waiting to address the board? I will try to answer that question without causing everybody to run the panic on my interference tonight. Uh, Mike, you're on mute. Mute the
All right, guys, I think I'm not supposed to speak tonight, which I really don't mind. I keep going, Brian. Just just let me sit back and not, not be on the spot tonight. Um, I got you. What do you need? All right, Brian, take, go ahead and take the lead. Seriously, I cannot speak. The delay. The hey, Brian, is there anybody waiting to address the board? That's a great question. Um, I can check with Cindy real quick. And okay, Cindy's coming in. Give me just one second. Okay. Okay, sure. So Cindy just came in with the list. Um, and we believe that Mr. Chapman is um, on and would like to address the board this evening. Mr. Chapman, are you on? Okay, um, we don't see him as I'm scrolling through my list of people that are here. So we'll move on to the next. Um, we also have Jen Ringgold as well. Hi. Hi, Jen. All right, I'm just getting my document up here. Thanks for your patience. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Ringgold. Um, and by this time, I hope that all of the board members have had a chance to read through the comments from more than 200 stakeholders that were collectively sent to all of you on Friday, sharing our uncertainty and unanswered questions about what school will look like starting six weeks from today. I personally understand the challenges you face making decisions about opening an organization in these times. I recognize the families that feel they have no other options but to go back to school. I lean into the difficult reality that there are children who need a safe place to go. And I know there are students who are not getting the services they need without school. I also understand the sheer unbelievability of what it might mean to continue to live into a time without the things our kids love, like sports and music and theater and being with their friends. The social emotional effects of living through a pandemic are immense for all of us and especially our children. But what does it say about us if we think that going back, going back to school during a pandemic is going to fix all this because it's not. Going back just brings up 40 pages in your hands of more questions. While some of those questions relate to the societal dilemmas I've mentioned, most of the unanswered questions relate to the science behind the safety of bringing together large groups of humans with an airborne virus that may have lasting and or deadly effects. A virus we have very little reported data on for children. Our Midland County numbers have steadily climbed since March and are still rising. We never plateaued and we never declined. And today it was reported that a third of the 45 COVID cases in Midland since July 1st are teenagers. The position you as board members are in seems an impossible place to be. And yet, months ago, we had a choice to begin imagining new ways of teaching and learning and helping families, but we didn't. Instead of getting creative input from our educators and our families and implementing a new hybrid way to move forward into this reality, we are meeting virtually to question the logistics of sending thousands of students and staff back to school in 40 days. I'm disappointed that in a city of modern explorers, we haven't explored anything new. We haven't provided our teachers effective training for how to engage students online. We've outsourced an online program that gives students a checklist of online tasks. We haven't followed the science that says keeping small groups of students together helps them stay safe. We're planning to order, we just did order thousands of masks and dust shields, hoping for the best without adequate testing, timely results, and robust tracing. We haven't dealt with asking the hard questions of who truly needs in-person and immediate support. And data says that we should address our elementary populations much differently than our middle schoolers and high schoolers, not just adding masks. So why are we trying to force a one-size-fits-all solution? The roadmap doesn't solve any of these problems or answer our questions. Instead of trying to figure out how to best protect those in your care, it is a, in fact actually a roadmap to potentially putting children and staff in harm's way, including my children, two who would be at Northeast and one at Millen High. The system is broken in so many ways, and yet here we are, forcing ourselves back into it. If we persist with this, if we try to force ourselves back into it right now, the reality is that some people may die in a way that could have been prevented if we had waited just a bit longer. If you cannot answer all of the 40 pages of questions that were sent to you on Friday, 
If you cannot keep staff and students safe from COVID-19, then I urge you to stop trying to go backwards. I urge you to create a different way to move forward. I urge you to take the necessary time to seek guidance from our brilliant Midland Public Schools educators. Create community partnerships with the hospital and medical professionals and talk to the families that represent those who are marginalized and need new options. Please do not support or vote on a plan that forces us to go backwards. You have the chance to make effective change and you do not need to wait for state guidelines to do the right thing. Instead of trying to salvage a broken system and potentially letting people die in the process, you have a chance to let the broken parts of the system die and save more people in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments and thank you for joining us tonight. Ryan, is there anybody else waiting? That was the conclusion of the official list. Um, okay. I'm not sure if there's anyone else out there that is requesting. Okay. Um, it looks like we are uh, done with the request to address the board. Um, so we'll move on. Next item is item five. This is CIA. Uh, this is going to be uh, Ms. Miller Nelson. Good evening, everyone. Uh, at our last meeting, I brought to you for information three resources for your consideration, and tonight those are back for your action. The following uh, resources, some physical books and some online materials, um, are here for your consideration. And, of course, the final purchase is contingent upon approval of, of our budget. The first is an online resource that will be used for our accounting two classes at both high schools, grades 10 through 12, and that is a resource through McGraw-Hill. The second is a physical text and workbook that will be used in our IB German class, uh, and that will be grades 10 through 12, and that's from Cambridge University Press. And the third resource are online components used for Spanish 1, 2, 3, Survey of Spanish 1 and 2, and that's grades 7 through 12. Uh, and that is from Garbanzo. Those are the three I have for your action tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I will accept the motion for item 5.1. I move to approve the administration's recommendation for the approval of the three books that we just, uh, that Penny just outlined. Or Motion was made by Pam. Support, it sounded like Phil. Uh, yeah. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion for item 5.1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Uh, next, we have item 6.1 6, uh, 6 under FFO. This is for information, uh, Brian. For information only this evening, we have three gifts to present to you for acknowledgement. The first from the Midland Area Community Foundation, and this was for some items for the class of 2020 at Midland High. The second was from First Robotics to support the Midland High Robotics team. And the third was from the Chestnut Hill Elementary PTO to support the annual magazine subscription fees. So we do appreciate the generosity of those three organizations for a total of $8,020 this evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Next up, we are at item 7.1 under human resources, uh, Mr. Jaster. Thank you, this is for information as well. The following staff member has announced her retirement effective as of June 12th, 2020, and that was Ms. Catherine Snyder. She has been a teacher at Dow High School um, for well over 20 years, and she was a social studies and psychology teacher there. Okay, we wish her well, and thank you very much. Uh, next is item 8.1, correspondence to and from the Board of Education. That is uh, listed in the agenda. Um, that takes us to item 9.1. These are the remaining dates for the scheduled board meetings. Um, note that there is a uh, budget workshop 6.30 p.m. on April 19th with the regular meeting directly following. Uh, finally, bringing us to the end of the night is the study discussion session. Um, are there any items or topics that need to be further discussed uh, or need clarification uh, by any of the board members? 
Hearing none, okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Was that Brad? Uh, yes. Hey, um, last week, or um, I sent out an email and concerned about uh, the purchasing process because I thought this was more than uh, not an emergency as Dow High would be for the PPE that we purchased, but more of an urgent nature. But it does sound like um, they vetted the purchases, so I'm, I'm happy with that, that it wasn't just a, a single product. It was multiple products that were examined for those purchases. Um, but another question that I did have in there, and Brian might be able to answer it, might not be able to, it's something that I posed in there is, um, as we spoke of the, the West Bloomfield uh, superintendent earlier in our, in our workshop before this meeting, he was also quoted in the free press of his $50 million school district that he was going to expect to spend four to five million in PPE to be able to safely open his schools. And I asked the question if, if we were getting closer to figuring out, I know Brian said that our first round of CARES Act money is $730,000. We are in line to hopefully with legislation get another $1.3 million to give us a full $2 million of CARES money. Um, I'm sure we're going to probably every bit of that, Brian, uh, to be able to do every aspect we need to do. In your estimation, do you think uh, Mr. Hill from West Bloomfield is, is high in his estimation or... I was just curious what your opinion is on, on, it's hard to say, I understand, of what our total spend would, would be for this, but do you have a, a gut feel of where we're headed? It's all about the context in which you're defining what your costs are going to be. And so I can't really contact, um, speak into the context of what their figure was based on. If you're talking just about physical PPE equipment, I would say that um, we're probably going to be somewhere in the million dollar range when this is all said and done. Um, we are still working on two large major purchases um, that we have to get to still, and that is water bottle filling stations. We have requests from the buildings for 51 of those, and those are somewhere in the neighborhood of roughly $1,000 each. Those are in incredible demand across the country right now because we know that water fountains themselves really aren't the safest item. And so we're having difficulties in finding them in bulk from one vendor, so it's sporadic sources. The other is hand sanitizing stations. We're going to be installing those in every single classroom and every major entry point within the district. We have a large district, so we need 685 of those. And you can do the math on those. That we believe is going to be somewhere in the $70,000 range. In addition, when you have 685 hand sanitizing stations, we're planning on somewhere near a gallon um, of the fill per student. So we're looking to procure somewhere around 8,000 gallons of the hand sanitizing solution. So when it's all said and done, we believe we're gonna be somewhere around the million dollar range. And that is contingent upon the longevity of the different phases that we're in as well too. I can easily get you, Brad, to around four or $5 million if you're gonna talk about total costs for the COVID-19 crisis. Our virtual model um, that um, I'm gonna let our FAQs talk a little bit more about when Mr. Shero releases those. I don't wanna speak out of turn right now because we're still working with our bargaining units on those, but it is gonna cost us extra um, FTEs for teachers to be able to staff that. We know right now that we're probably gonna need somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four to five elementary standalone virtual teachers. And the way that the numbers are working, that does not mean a reduction in actual classroom teachers. That's gonna help us with social distancing by reducing class size numbers, but it is gonna be an additional cost. An average teacher cost is easy to put a $100,000 bill on it, depending on what their veteran status is within the district. So that's adding another four to $500,000 there, even more if it's a more senior teacher, even more if they take full family benefits. Um, on top of that, um, the work that Penny's group has done with the different phases of our continuity of learning plan Canvas, purchasing devices, et cetera, et cetera. I could easily get you to the four to five million total range, but what is exact equipment versus salary versus something we would have done before or after mental health supports? When it's all said and done, um, I could see that number as being realistic depending on what the context of the definition is. We're tracking very closely on this and every single expense that's related to it. These grants, when they are federal in nature, have to have specific accounting codes to them. And so every single expense that we relate to COVID, we're tracking with those codes. 
when the dust settles on the storm, eventually we'll be able to give you an exact, but as we're in the middle of it right now, we're still in the phase of what it is. So to answer your question in its entirety, um, I can't contact, I can't speak to the context of what his quote was. I believe we're going to be somewhere in the million dollar range for physical equipment, but it would not at all surprise me if in the end we were somewhere in that three to five range total in additional services when all is said and done to be able to get us through this storm, um, which is, again, something we talked about in our budget process of you know, being able to lean on our fund balance to be able to help us through this crisis, be able to service this generation of students that we need, we know needs higher services than any students ever had before. And our group that is custodial, is that, is that, um, that's a negotiated thing, is that going up? Because we have to do totally different cleaning. I mean, we have to do a lot more. So mm -hmm. additional costs for yes, our custodial services? We anticipate that there will be an increased rise in our needs with our Enviro Clean contract. Yes. Okay. Have we uh, reached out to some of the bigger corporations in the area of the Dow Chemicals, the DuPonts, the Cortevas, to see if they have interest in assisting us with uh, any of these items? Ironically, we just received notice today that we were the beneficiary of an approximately eighty thousand dollar grant um, from it worked through the Midland Area Community Foundation for the generosity of Dow Chemical. So we were pleased to be able to get that um, as well. We also know that there's somewhere on the horizon another um, Corona or COVID package that will be coming from the federal government. We are looking into our crystal ball, and we believe that that may be a state aid supplement to help avoid some of the drastic per pupil cuts that are out there, but we don't know that what that money is gonna look like either. So right now on paper, I have six different pots of CARES related money that we are working with and um, seeking grant opportunities every single day, every single which way that we can possibly get them to help offset some of these costs. A lot of them, like I said, have regulations that are attached to them of what specifically you can use them for. Some are PPE specific, some are salary specific, some are salary specific with mental health related um, items as well. So lots of different conditions, places of money that we're tracking very closely. And yes, seeking every revenue source that we possibly can. As well as I forgot to mention Mid Michigan. I know that would be another place to reach out to to see if they can help us in any way. Was there? Of course, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, Mr. McFarland, um, I just briefly chatted with Mr. Cheryl because his feedback isn't working the proper way. Um, two things that Mr. Sherrill would like to deliver to the community. Um, number one, a reminder that graduation is this Friday. Um, if you are the proud parent of a Dow High or Midland High senior, make sure that you are looking to your building administration for guidance. I know that Midland High released a video tutorial this morning. I haven't seen Dow Highs yet, but I know that Mr. Davis has been communicating with his constituents as well, too. So we're excited to be able to be a part of that ceremony. While it's not ideal, we know that it's going to be something that at least will provide that opportunity um, for some semblance of a graduation. And then also the last piece is to be sure community to look for the next edition of the superintendent communique. Um, I believe our anticipated date on that is Thursday of this week, which is gonna give us some time to vet some of the items further with our staff, with our teachers and our bargaining units as well too. Um, to be able to provide some of the items that came to us in the community questions. So it's uh, multiple pages. We've been working on it for a couple of days now, and we hope that that will give the community some answers to some of the questions that have been posed and should provide a little bit more clarity. So I believe the release date on that is going to be Thursday. Mike, if you can give me kind of a nod that that's the plan. Yep. Okay. So look Thursday for a pretty in-depth FAQ document to come out that should help with some of those lingering questions. Okay, thanks, Brian, and uh, thank you, Mike. Um, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. Take a motion okay. to adjourn. Okay, uh, all in favor? Motion by Phil, support by Pam. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers tonight.